seek us and to save us so we just thank the Lord for all that he is to us this day this is resurrection yeah. day this Passover Sunday where we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth yeah. we just thank the Lord that he is with us continually Amen. thank the Lord bless the Lord for all that do gather in his name uh, thank of course following service we will have communion today and we thank the Lord for those that are here whether you're Longtime worshiper with us, or uh, just uh, here for uh, today on a, a visitor basis, all are welcome to partake of the uh, the bread and the cup that symbolize the body and the blood of the Lord. Amen. So we just thank the Lord that He is uh, with us. Uh, we praise the Lord continually. Amen. His praises are always within our mouth. So we just uh, have the opportunity to show that out through our actions and confirm our faith in Jesus' Amen. name. So we just thank the Lord today on this you, very special day. Uh, just as an announcement for those that are uh, interested in the revival and renewal meetings in Bloomington, Indiana, coming up on the uh, 21st, 22nd, 23rd of the month. do have a phone number for reservations back in the Sunday school room. And uh, for anyone to see me about ar arrangements or for any reason, uh, make it known, and we'll try to do things in a gospel way. Amen. Thank the Lord for the gathering together, the gathering of the tribes together. Amen. The churches and fellowships and tabernacles of, who worship the Lord in spirit and truth. We just were thankful for those things. Amen. As we turn our attention to matters prayer of prayer, the foremost issue today is for Aaron Janes and the Janes family. Uh, Aaron had a sudden and a serious condition arise, which uh, they're in the middle of evaluating those things even as we speak. He is stable at this moment, but it's serious and it needs prayer. So I uh, just uh, want to pray for strength for Sister Patty, Sister Zoe and family, for Brother Terry and Sister Carol. Brother Terry has his own uh, scheduled maintenance. Uh, physical maintenance 
appointment on the 13th. We pray there's no delay in that and that the conditions will just uh, come about in a gospel manner and there would be healing and, and peace there. Uh, this is why we pray. This is why we Amen. worship for, for moments because sometimes you, you get the news, you know, that uh, changes your day and it can change your life. So uh, we just pray for healing there and for uh, a good diagnosis for Aaron. Yeah. And also remembering uh, those that are various ones are traveling. Uh, Sister Dory comes home on the on Tuesday, I believe, and been praying along with her for her granddaughter Bella for uh, had to have oral surgery. So we just right. pray for that situation to right itself. In Jesus' name, Sister Judy Bentz traveling back and forth to California, and also for Sister Margo, who will be taking a little tour of Europe, uh, not here with us today, but uh, and remembering Sister Margo's mother also for recovery issues and, and uh, for life issues that are attendant to her health and well-being. So we just yeah. thank the Lord for all the things that he is to us today. Sure, Amen. Thanking the Lord that he hears prayer, that he meets our needs, and that he's a deliverer out of amen. all those that are oppressed yeah. well, and afflicted and wounded. So amen. Thank the Lord for his blessings today. I'm going to have Brother Joe, if he would. If Brother Joe will come forward. Remembering these uh, prayer requests for today and just thanking the Lord for the spirit of worship being in the house today as we indeed we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Amen. Amen. Brother Jim. Amen. Bless the Lord. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you've made. And oh Lord, all the prayer requests that were mentioned, Lord, those that are sick, those that are injured those that are aged, those that are traveling. Lord, be with each and every one yes. of them and yes. protect them and keep them. Lord, you're the light of our life. You yes. are our life. Yes. So lead them and guide them through this trial of life that they're going through right now. Lord, yes. Lord we thank you for the power of the resurrection. Yes. Lord, we have the symbol of the sunshine that rises every morning. Yes. Lord, the yes. seasons that come where the crops come, all the symbol of the power of your resurrection, you, Father, which is the power of eternal life, which is in you, yeah, in which power you gave to us. So we thank you for that. Lord, the preaching that's coming forth to teach us about your life and your ways, Lord, we ask that you anoint the pastor. The song service, Lord, that the joy, that it would be pleasing to you. You said that yes, our prayers and our praises would be like a sweet smelling incense that yeah. rises right up from us into your presence. You. So, Lord, we thank you for that all. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our thank King. You, Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Lord. Bless the Lord. He was wounded for our transgressions. Thank you, Lord.
is this day. Amen. We were born to serve him. There's purpose in all that we see around us, and we thank the Lord. And we're going to sing Born to, I was born to serve the Lord. It's on page blue 15 in your songbook. So uh, thank the Lord. Amen. God continually blesses us. This life we know, it's precious. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. It showed in the life of Jesus, even as he wept at the tomb. And uh, there was an arisal there, and that wouldn't be the last one. Amen. Yeah. Thank the Lord. We thank the Lord that he has arisen for us this day, and he rises up in our hearts. Amen. So let's praise him by singing, I was born to serve the Lord. closer to who you are than when you realize that I was born to serve the Lord. Amen. 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 Thank the Lord. When you worship God, you're worshiping truth itself. Amen. But truth thank is in Lord. a person. It's living. Amen. It's living in Christ. So we thank the Lord for the spirit of revelation that leads his dear children onward. Amen. 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 In Jesus' name. You may be seated at this time as Brother Bill comes forward. Amen. With the the specials, amen, that get us going in a gospel way and lift up our spirits in yeah. Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Brother Bill. Amen. God bless Brother Ryan. God bless everyone today. It's good to see everybody here today. Amen. You know, God took time out for us. It's not so much to ask for that God, that we can take time out for him too. So right. God bless everyone today. Good to see everyone. We'll get right into the specials, and the first one we will sing is, us brothers will sing, I Got Saved.
your brothers and God bless your sister Miriam. We have a group special and it's called Celebrate. Everybody's welcome to clap along. Yeah. 
Selection, we will sing covered by the blood. We're covered by the blood. We're covered by the blood. We're 
they're covered by the blood of the Lamb. We're covered by the blood. We're covered by the blood. We're covered by the blood of the Lamb. Death cannot hold you. Death has to pass over when you're covered. Bless your brothers and sisters, and Sister Miriam on the piano, and the sisters on the instrument. That's awesome. Our next special will be the wall of prayer. Amen.
God bless you, brothers and sisters. Sister Miriam on the piano for us. For our last selection, Sister Rachel and Sister Patty. Miriam accompanying them. Passover, hallelujah.
again they came to move the stone and bless the slain with oil and spice anointing hallelujah but as they went to move the stone they saw that they were not alone but jesus christ has risen hallelujah 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 Beautiful sisters. Amen. God bless you for that. And Sister Miriam on the piano. God bless you. If we'll all stand before Pastor Ryan comes to bring forth the word of truth unto us today. If you want to sing with us for sure, let's turn to page 198 in your green book. And we will sing, He Lives. Of all who find, not 
another is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. the Lord, knowing that he lives, amen, that just makes all the difference in Jesus' name. So just before we pray out, just before we build up a wall of prayer around us, amen, just like to report the latest condition of Aaron James does look good, so there's positive news, so we just thank the Lord for prayer, thank the Lord for salvation, deliverance, whatever is ongoing, amen, it's in the Lord's hands. So as we bow our heads and think on these things, as Sister Miriam plays through the Amen. Thank you, Father, that you do live within our hearts. Father God, may each and every Christian, those that have taken the name of Jesus upon themselves and made it their identification, may they be highly blessed who call upon the name of the Lord, the source of all eternal truth. Father, and may that word just live within our hearts today, now and forevermore. Let the praises ring out. Let the hallelujahs roll in Jesus' name. Father, as we partake of your body broken for us, your blood that is shed, Father, may each and every person here be a partaker of the divine will and wholly so, completely. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen and amen. Well, glory to God in the highest. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for the praises of acclamation as the brothers and sisters make their way out. May be seated. Well, blessed Lord, amen. Thank the Lord that we are met this day, that he's gathered us here together today, knowing that there is purpose for it all. There's purpose just beyond uh, the day-to-day things of the of life, and the Lord knows we have need of those things, but amen. Thank the Lord, he is so much more to us. Amen, he is life itself, as we hearken to the words of life this day, and make mention of the Lord's mercies, which endure forever, is his nature, that desires to grant solace, desires to grant peace to us. His nature never changes, and because he is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to him for life of the never-ending sort. He was willing to lay down his life for us. Amen. So today we just celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. As how does an eternal God experience such a thing? Well, the whole Bible's written to answer that question of what Jesus did upon the cross in order to go undergo uh, such a work of love that is unsurpassed, as Jesus himself exclaimed, greater love has no man or any person, that they would lay down their life for someone else. The Almighty put himself into a body of flesh, even as we are. That's the miracle of it all. Of course, which uh, tends uh, to the, it's tending to the upcoming time here of remembering his sacrifice upon the cross. And also, this being the time of Jesus' birth, not as commonly reported on the December 25th holiday, but it's the springtime of the year that the lambs of sacrifice were born, and all the internal evidence of the scripture points to that, as the shepherds abiding in the field and and, uh, so forth, waiting for the lambs in the spring to be born, because that's the only time they could be born, and thus it is the Uh, the time of Jesus' birth as well. So, uh, as we look to these things and take them into our remembrance, we especially look to that moment of Golgotha, 
a Latin translation, Mount Calvary. That ninth hour of the day before Passover, when the master would pay the ransom debt for sin. And in the words of our title, he was willing to do this, willing to take the cup. As we'll speak of what God was willing to do upon the cross, what he was willing to do for you and I, willing to take the cup. And of course, we symbolize that within our worship today. As the things that the God of heaven and the Lord of hosts was willing to undergo, it's truly of an astounding nature, no matter how much you know it. It never ceases to amaze, or at least it shouldn't, even if one has been a Christian all their life. As the word revealing itself in Christ it is astonishing, and somebody, uh, no matter who it is, any, any one of us should always feel that way, For uh, just like those who were astonished at Jesus' doctrine out of Matthew 7, 28. Uh, there, because Jesus taught as if uh, those scriptures were alive, didn't just dryly repeat them, but spoke with authority about them as if, as if he owned them, as if they were his own words which in fact, of course, they were. This gospel teaches us that with authority and the life held within, amen, we're blessed of the almighty God. These scriptures are not just merely for rep repetition. There's a beauty and there's an ebb and flow and a poetry to the King James language that we use uh, for our uh, spoken word messages and so forth. But it's not just for that, it's because there's life. There's life within the words of the way. As the early Christians, before they began to be called Christians, were called people of this way or that way, often derisively so by those who did not share the gospel. But to the story thereof, amen, thank the Lord, we come to it once more, for the words of life will bring to us an empty tomb and the and the telling thereof, it never does get old. The old, old story Amen. never does get old. Amen. It's always new. It's new life every time that we tell it. It's new to us every time we hear it. And, of course, there are opposing factions in the world. You've all noticed that. The preaching of this gospel and the rising from the dead, it's foolishness to the secular world out there that doesn't take God into account so-called foolishness to them. But to us, it's the power of God, for it's the chosen pathway whereby the Lord makes himself to be known unto us. And certainly there is wisdom built into the scripture. It appeals to the intellect, but it does not rely on intellectualism, as it were, as that might be defined as the way that humankind looks at things and puts values to different uh, concepts. But its aim is at the heart and soul of each and every one of us. And at the Last Supper before resurrection, I always like to remind that there would be another Last Supper. That would be following resurrection. Boy, what a good one that is. Amen. That doesn't get spoken about as much. As Jesus said, have ye here any meat in Luke chapter 24? And there was some broiled fish and honeycomb that he partook of. So uh, thank the Lord. But Jesus was so, in the events of all these things, Jesus was so determined. He was so willing to take of the cup, the shedding of his blood. He was so determined to do all these things. And, and what is it that gives somebody the strength to undergo such a trial? To follow through and even face martyrdom. His look was set in stone, so to speak. His face set like a flint, as the prophet Isaiah spoke thusly in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 7. As the prophet's inspiration looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, as uh, the book of Isaiah is so much of the story of the coming of Jesus. Uh, you have to be very resolute. You have to be very determined. You have to be very straightforward. You have to believe in something very deeply in order to drink of that cup. And so it was as Jesus 
showed character that only comes by absolute truth of his mission and the willingness to perform to the highest standard of love that can be found, one that's unsurpassed, one that gives of its life for others. That's the motivation. That's the whole story of Jesus. It has to be the motivation. Why else would someone do that? Why else would he endure? So taking it all in total, the desire of the Lord is to be close to us. For these reasons, he did these things, in order to be a friend, in order to stick closer to us than a brother, to be a guide as a father creator, as a redeemer, as a justifier of the soul, in order to be our great high priest, one that it's not that he can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He took them upon the cross. He committed to feel those things, just as we do. So thank the Lord. So we walk with him this day. As we make our way through the scriptures here on our spiritual pilgrimage, having the joy of discovery of the written word, and faith shows its willingness to walk with him. Turn with me to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26, or just follow along as I, I read, but the scripture reference is the book of Matthew, 26 chapter, as what we do today is preparation for, of course, our own taking of the cup and identifying ourselves with the body and blood of the Lord. That's, it's your spiritual calling card. It's your identification to pray the prayer of salvation, be baptized in Jesus' name, and then uh, to commune with him as, as we're very determined also. As was Jesus the Messiah, who was very determined on his course to pay the awful cost. And in spite of all the hatred, the unbelief, the resistance, he stayed to the pathway, stayed true to it, to the purpose ordained of old. And here in Matthew chapter 26, as we reach some of the prophetic fulfillment scriptures of those things that are written in the prophets of the Old Testament, Matthew 26 and from the 26th verse. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it. So gave it to the disciples, take eat, this is my body. Then took the cup, drink ye all of it. For the, You have to be fully invested in this. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the, this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. So drink all of it. Put your whole self into it. Put everything that you have, heart and mind, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Drink ye all of it. And the willingness to follow through, it showed in every word, it showed in the, in the early days of Jesus' ministry just prior to it. The determination showed in the three temptations there following the 40-day fast in the wilderness. At the beginning of the messenger of the covenant mission there, and it does not waver here. Even in the face of betrayal, which is the earlier verses, we read from 26, the earlier verses that speak to the betrayal and the warnings of, of that. So Jesus, even in the warnings of the betrayal, is given in verse 25 because uh, Jesus warned that uh, there was a darkness at the door, but even in the knowing of that and the subsequent trial of, and scourging, he would follow through. He would follow through, for this is my blood, <clears throat> excuse me, of the New Testament, the new covenant, which is shed before you, and that's beforehand, given to show the truth of it and the events that would soon transpire. As so quickly, when you read the account of what was coming forth, <clears throat> so quickly were events happening. Prophecies were fulfilling themselves in minutes, hours. 
within the same day. Where's all the prophecies? You know, the Micah 5 2 prophecy, it took many centuries. That's the birth in Bethlehem uh, prophecy of Micah the prophet. Uh, it took thousands of years for that <clears throat> to transpire, as given in Genesis 3 15. Hundreds of years from the time of Micah 5 2. But it all came to the fore. But at crucifixion time, things were just so greatly speeded up uh, to show uh, the truth of this all. So uh, events quickly happening there, uh, which the apostles at the time, uh, in the heat of the moment, so to speak, and in, things were so rapidly uh, going on, events were happening so quickly, uh, they little understood in just the, the timing of the moment. It would take the resurrection power in order to get them uh, all together on the same page as they examined all things and put it all together of the things that Jesus was speaking of. And those things that Jesus was speaking of, it was a warning too, for betrayal was at the door. There are many chances that Jesus gave Judas to turn aside from the dark intent of his heart, and that's very real. Choices are always set before us. We can choose to go right or left. Uh, we can choose the right thing or the wrong thing, and that was true for one Judas Iscariot. He, it's very real. He could have changed course. But he made his decision, and the foreknowledge of God perceived it all. But yet the knowledge of a future event does not cause the event to happen. Judas made his choice, as do we all, as to who this Jesus, whom we name as both Lord and Christ, is. Judas was willing to betray. Jesus was willing to be betrayed. How about that? How many of you come across a point in your life like that where you were willing uh, to endure betrayal? It's a unique experience. Jesus was willing to take that cup and all that came with it. But yet, uh, remember this, and we'll read it in our next verse, which is verse 30. Even at that time, Jesus was willing to do this. He was willing to sing, for Matthew 26 and verse 30 says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. I love that scripture. It's just, a, it's, it, you know, if you just pass by it, it just looks like a connecting verse, connecting one event to another. But there's great spiritual significance into it. For one, it answers the question, did Jesus sing? Well, yes, he did. Sang along. Possibly one of the psalms themselves that were commonly sung at the Passover celebration, which harkens back to that original Passover night. In Egypt, when the angel of death passed over the Hebrew children, when they saw the blood, amen, passed over. And uh, the, Mose uh, the Mosaic holiday comes from that uh, original time. But they sung a hymn. And psalms from uh, especially the 114th through the 118th psalm, those psalms were traditionally sung at Passover time, so it may have been one of those. It may have been a portion of it. That's unknown to us. might have been one of their own composition. Uh, whatever the case may be, there was victory within the soul of the master. And not only was he willing to take the cup, he was so inclined as to sing a song of praise. And that's really something. When you can sing in the face of adversity, and sing in the day of trial, and have the victory in spite of the sorrow and anguish of this world, that is truly astounding. That's, that raises faith to another level. That gets you into the eternal realm. And here's your example in Christ, because what Jesus would endure, this is the triumph of the soul over death itself. It's the triumph over the sting of death. Now you have to have the power of the resurrection to back that up or else without that your faith is in vain. You know, it would be devoid of any real substance. Without resurrection power there's no eternal life. But when words of praise are mixed with eternal faith, that rolls away the stone. Amen. Thank the Lord. It opens up the passageway to heaven and, and that's what matters forever and giving a never-ending witness that life in Christ 
cures us of death, which I like to say, that, you know, just the phrase, you know, the world conditions you to believe that death takes away life. We're Christians. We believe that life takes away death. In Jesus' name, amen. In this world, yes, you'll have to cry a few tears at the grave. There are sorrows that come with it. But oh, for the joy in the morning, amen, that wipes away the tears in that prophecy that uh, unfolds, and it will be so. Thank the Lord in the new heavens and new earth, which is to come. And that matters forever, amen, as all our hope is based upon the resurrection. For if Jesus is not raised and all things weren't brought to pass in him, uh, then you'd be still in your sins. You'd be stuck in, the, in this world without hope. But now, thank the Lord, I see the light. Amen. It's not my light, it's his light. Thank the Lord. I get to give a witness of it. Amen. Bless the Lord. We see the light. And we can sing about that as we have this day in celebrating the resurrection of the Lord. We can sing the song of the Messiah. Amen. Have it in our hearts of what Jesus sang about here in Matthew 26 and verse 30. In fulfillment of all that is written. So Jesus, yes, he died for our sins. But, you know, I don't like to automatically assume everyone that just knows what that means. What does, it, what does that uh, encompass in spiritual terms that he died for our sins? Here's an example. If someone crosses the street, but they're going against the traffic sign, uh, the red light's up, but they cross anyway, uh, the don't walk is lit up, but they choose to walk out into the street, the next person come along, sees that, they run out and they push you out of the way of the oncoming car, and they save their life, but they lose their own. That's what Jesus did there at Calvary. That's where he did on Golgotha. But to do that, the second person, in this analogy it's Christ who saved our life, the second person, the one who had to save your life, they broke the law, technically speaking, because the light was still red. But nonetheless, you know, the don't walk sign is lit up, you know, in our analogy story, our type of parable. Well, Jesus did that. Jesus did that, but on a far greater scale. For he broke the law in that, the law says this, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. He was willing to endure the curse for us. He broke the law, but it was out of the spirit of love and willingness to save, which is a greater precept. It's above all, it's above the letter of the law. Letter of the law kills but the Spirit makes alive. And that's what happened upon the cross. Amen. As Paul stated, uh, the, law, it, the law, it was righteous and holy and true, but, and it was set in place for a reason. It's still doing its work today within us. But as Paul stated, the old covenant law was a schoolmaster, a type of ancient truant officer. It was put in place in order to get you to the teacher of righteousness himself. And it was set in place uh, to get people to where one sacrifice, one sacrifice would suffice for all transgressions. And when the messenger of the covenant himself died, so did the old law. And a new covenant was set in place, which the old covenant spoke of, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, surrounding scriptures, that this new covenant would be the one where I would put a new heart within them. And they would understand the precepts of the law instinctively, which spoke better things than the, the blood of sacrifices of, of sheep and goats and so forth. So that, and now, because of that, the greater precept gets realized for not only the curse of he who hangs upon a tree, not only is that gone, but this also, for cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written, which is Deuteronomy 27 and verse 26, uh, which is comprehended in James, the uh, book of James in the New Testament. Because if you go by the law, if you've broken one law, you've broken them all. 
If you get nine out of the, can you get nine out of the Ten Commandments right? Well, if you've broken one of them, you've transgressed them all. Because holiness is breached. And uh, you cannot be partial on the law in keeping the commandments. They say, well, I'll do these, but I won't do the others, and I'm still batting 600 or something like that. It has to be better than that. Holiness is holiness. Amen. And uh, we couldn't live up to that standard of humankind. Sin nature was too strong. We weren't able to bear up under it, as Peter once said there in Acts chapter 15. Why would you put a yoke on the necks of the Gentile church coming in? Uh, we weren't able to bear up under it. Uh, this is the new law set in place. And that's why Christ had to pay the awful cost to bring us to this point. Because there is a debt to sin, one that would keep us out of the presence of the king. So he had to sanctify us. What is sanctification? Take something that is not holy and turn it into something that is, and that is a miracle. The Bible starts with a miracle in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. Miracles never cease throughout. And, and it's amazing to us, it's astounding, but to God, it's, he's the Lord. Nothing's impossible with him. So it's a, it's a normal state of being the almighty God to him. But thank the Lord, he brings his life to us, makes us holy, who were not holy, to get us into his presence where we're surrounded by eternal light. And there has to be a consistency to it. God has to remain true to his given word and holiness. He has to stay true to his nature. He wanted us there. He wanted us there with him. Why so? It's because it's out of love, and thus he made it possible for what seemed to be impossible to do. There had to be a way. And the life and the, the birth and the death and the arisal of Jesus was the game changer of, of all time. So again, what does that mean? That Christ died for us. How does the shedding of blood pay for the sins of, that would overwhelm us? Again, death was the speeding car, the price of iniquity that he pushed us out of the way of as death is a, the wages of sin nature. It's the price of sin. It came there in the beginning, <clears throat> the advent of the human race, the disobedience, and the partaking of a sensual act, a sense-driven act, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is representing the opponent of God, the enemy himself. God's the tree of life. He's the source of all knowledge and wisdom. So it's a, a metaphoric statement to stand for God uh, himself as being the tree of life. And there was an opponent there for which God said, you'll surely die in the, in the day that you eat thereof. If you partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, don't even touch it. Not that they would, uh, death when it came in, not that they would just fall down dead on the spot, but death would enter into the equation by the consequences of that act. Death would enter into the world as the result of such a, an action. And it did, it did by a murderous act. Cain rose up and slew his brother Abel. So the shedding of blood was required to make the man and the woman, the, as you know, the biblical story. Uh, he had to make them coats of skins which necessitated the death of an animal in order to clothe them, and it would take blood to cover the sins of all who came thereafter. So why did Jesus die? Why did he shed his blood? To cover us. To cover us, amen. To cover sins. To undo the damage, Jesus would have to commit an act that was the opposite of murder. You ever thought of that? What's the opposite of murder? The opposite of murder is martyrdom. So he had to commit the opposite of that act and did so willingly for others. He suffered the body broken. He suffered the blood shed for us to stay consistent by eternal principle values. 
principles and values because th there's an argument going on in the eternal realm. There, uh, you can see it in the first two chapters of the book of Job. As redemption had to come by eternal precepts and thoughts from, from the beginning that were the reasons for the origins of life itself and the battle for salvation was on uh, from the Garden of Eden. So take note of that. Jesus had to shed his blood, experience death, to prove that love is eternal, existing of itself, because some things are eternal in nature. Love is one of those things. Love is an eternal thought. Mankind did not invent love. It was always there, waiting in the heart and mind of Almighty God to be discovered. You can't say, well, this was the first day that love came into being. It's an eternal thought. It exists outside of time. So there are things that are eternal. Truth is an, uh, it's an eternal word also. Truth always existed, and that truth is in a person, and I have evidence of that, which is all of you here today. You're living, breathing, sentient, able to think. I think, therefore I am. God did that very thing, amen. And his thoughts and expression created the universe that we see around us because he is the existing truth that exists of itself because you cannot get back to a time when truth started. It's impossible. It exists beyond the realm of time. And God is that, and he's a person. And we're, uh, the truth had a personality, and we're all here as a result of that fact. And we exist to prove that, amen, that love is eternal. And in the time of Job, the man, as you recall, he was accused, chapters 1 and 2, for essentially this reason. Well, sure, he uh, worships God, and the Bib uh, King James word is a shoe is evil. We don't use that much in modern English. But he won't have anything to do with evil. But he just does that because of the benefits derived. Job proved that love was eternal. Because he worshiped God, he would not sin with his lips in spite of the fact that of this it would finally get him to say this, though he slay me, yet I'll trust him because he knew where truth was. Amen. He had that within his heart. And even though he did not understand the circumstances around him, uh, being the best person at that moment on earth, nobody's ever exceeded the character of Job. He had a personality like Noah, like Enoch, uh, in, in that class, he was a man that wouldn't have anything to do with evil, feared God and kept all God's commandments. Best person on the face of the earth, but even he needed humbleness of repentance because of the fact that sin nature exists. And he endured and he trusted the Lord for the sake of love itself. Book of Job, he proved that love was eternal, that it has no beginning and no ending. And Jesus would have to love us for the sake of love itself to fulfill holiness. Because of what benefit were we now? After sin nature got in the door, as we were creatures infected by uh, the heritage of what happened in the Garden of Eden, as the accuser thought he'd severed the link between creator and created ones forever. Because of this, that which is unholy, it's not fit to be in the presence of Almighty God. But God wanted us there. He wanted us there. So how do you solve a problem like that? Well, the life of Jesus in this biblical story is the way. For that which is unholy of itself can now enter into the holy of holies. A way would have to be found to get us into heaven even though throughout the course of history, and it's certainly true in the headlines today, humankind has done little but vex the Lord's patience ever since Eden. And the life of sacri and sacrifice of Jesus was the way to get us uh, back on track, and Jesus would prove that out on the cross. He would prove that love is eternal, for, because he could have ended it all right there, as you know. He, but he was willing to take the cup. What could he have done? He could have called 12 legion of angels to destroy the world and set him free. So when Jesus said, I am the, in St. John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he wasn't kidding. 
He was being very liter literal. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And those are eternal words too, because a way doesn't have physical substance to it. Truth doesn't exist in a material sense. And life came about, amen, it being eternal because God was there in the, before our beginnings, amen. He's the one that spoke creation into existence, held the measuring line in his hand, mathematics runs the universe, but the great mathematician, scientist, philosopher of all time, whom we name as God, as God the Lord, King of saints, Lord, Lord of all creation, King of kings, Lord of lords, he spoke that way to, into existence, way with a capital W in it, amen. So now we're children of the way. And he had to endure, and he was tempted in all, po all points that there are, but remained sinless himself in order to be true. That's the heritage of the saints, amen. And Christ's actions made it all, all to be legal, in the, if you understand the sense of uh, the way I use that, in the sense of fulfilling higher love. Otherwise, the accuser would have had a much greater argument than he was able to come up with in the book of Job. But in the face of all the things that Jesus faced and in the face of all that resistance and all that hardness of heart, Jesus stayed true to the intent of Scripture. Here in Matthew 26, where, while we're here, from the 36th verse, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, which would be James and John of the apostles, the inner circle of the twelve, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Well, thank the Lord that he sang there in verse 30. You know what he was doing? He was putting on garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Amen. Amen. That's what he was doing. Because it, it, it'll get you through. The spirit of heaviness, big, bit very heavy within his spirit. All right. Verse 38. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, wait here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, can you, can you see the emotion of it? Can you see the, the human part of all that Christ was? We, we were created in his image. All the things that Jesus was, all those character traits are put within us. And he felt everything uh, as a human being there in his pilgrimage upon earth. And he prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And then just what was to confirm which was uh, that which was the need of the moment, as to the status of the heart, Jesus will declare it once again, verse 42 of the same chapter. If this cup not pass from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Such willingness, such determination to fulfill the mission, to take of the cup and to drink it all, even if the suffering thereof would be so terrible. But thus it must be to finish transgression, make an end of sins, and to anoint the most holy, all the things that are contained in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. He became reconciled the cross to bring about the peace of it, the end result of it, and those things had to, had to be kept. It, it's a wonder when you, look, when you look through the scriptures. A lot of divine forethought and preparation went into this gospel. This isn't just haphazard. Everything that's written is written for a reason. And did Jesus feel the pressure of the moment just the same way you and I would, longing to escape from the judgment and the terrible scourging? Escape the torment, escape the voices of those who derided him and, and so forth, hit him and said, prophesy, who is it that hit you, and even of these things. Did he desire to escape all that just as, as we would? Sure did. Sure did. Felt every bit of it. 
The responsibility was laid upon him. The weight of the world. You know, we have uh, weights in this world that we have to carry forth. We have to provide for families. We have to uh, keep the car running. You have to work a, a, a job, you know, to keep the paycheck coming. All right. The responsibility of everything, of all creation, was upon the Lord. The responsibility for you and I, for our very lives, it was laid upon him, shown in advance, Isaiah 9, 6, the government upon his shoulder, as it prophesied there. So he felt the weight of the impending trial, every bit of it. In Psalms, Psalms 116, Psalms 116 might be one of the very, might be the very psalm they sang after going out from the mount. That's not recorded, but thank the Lord for the praises that are recorded. Amen. There'd be no turning back from that which was appointed from the very beginning. Blood had to be shed for blood. One life for the lives of many. Life's in the blood. Uh, the mystery of the soul, how it's joined to the body, all that's contained within the blood. And the life is found here in the book of Psalms from 116. We'll start at the 12th verse, which reads, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? What, what can I give? Well, an offering would have to be given, which is uh, the title of our afternoon service. Uh, here on Passover Sunday. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. S sound familiar? Sound like anyone you know? Sound like the instance of Jesus taking the cup? It's all here. It's all written. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. That's what Jesus did upon the cross. A lot of thought, intricately written, and uh, so beautifully as it leads up to the time of Christ, it's all here. Because of verse 15, this precept, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. He would commit an act that was the opposite of murder. He would commit martyrdom. Amen. And that's precious in his sight because it serves a higher purpose. Verse 16, O Lord, truly I am thy servant. Jesus proved that out on the cross. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. Son of thine handmaid, what did Mary say? She was the handmaid of the Lord in that respect. It's, she was a chosen vessel, bore the Christ child. Thou hast made me free, or loosed my bonds in the language of the King James. Verse 17, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. There has to be praise through the midst of, of all these things. It's praise and thanksgiving, but it, there in, in the moment when the psalm was composed, but it's directed ahead, forwarded to the very same time into the future that would show the mindset of one Jesus of Nazareth. As Nathaniel of St. John chapter 1 once said, Upon hearing about one, we found one who's the Messiah. He asked the question, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? As it turns out, the only thing that ever was any good came out of Nazareth in the life of Christ. The only thing born in Bethlehem, brought out of Egypt, after the exile in Egypt in the early years, raised in Nazareth, crucified in Jerusalem, albeit outside the city gate, outside the city walls. Christ fulfilled scripture, lived as a Nazarene, which the scriptures uh, spake of that too. One who lives the life of the priest but doesn't hold the office as the tribe of Levi, but he would be our great high priest of a different order, the order of Melchizedek, who, whom Abraham paid tithes to, 
four centuries before the law was given. So the pattern for Jesus' willing soul to take the cup, it was in here. You can write a biography of the life of Christ from the Psalms alone. And through the prophets from Isaiah, most notably from, from Micah, and all those things that format and give us the foundation of the life of Jesus, it's all in, in here. You need the New Testament to shed light on it so you can understand it. But it's all written here, amen, long before the event happened, and time is no barrier to the Master himself. He dwells beyond that. He is the spirit of ever-existent truth that lives of itself, because truth has to exist. It has to make itself known of a necessity, and it did in Christ. In Psalms 119, just forward to Psalms 119, we're going to read from the 145th verse, is the Psalm of Psalms, as it was called. It was the lengthiest and uh, probably considered the most sacred of all, all the Psalms. All the old, old stories outlined in advance of the completion. The evidence is there. Psalm 1610. Thou wilt not leave my soul in the place of the grave. You'll not leave my soul in hell. Psalms 22. It sings of that which would transpire at Golgotha, at the cross. You could count his bones, count the, count the bones in the rib cage, so weakened and from blood loss, so emaciated was the body that Jesus probably, just in physical uh, being, probably would have died from uh, the wounds that he suffered even without the crucifixion. But nonetheless, put to the cross. Psalms 22 tells you the story of that. He did all these things to be our tree of life, to be the vine of the tree that supports all else. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Amen. All right, so Jesus did all these things, and we come to Psalms 119 from the 145th verse, this section. I cried with my whole heart, Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. I cried unto thee, Save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. Now, does that remind you of the cross? It's all here as you look through the lens of the life of Jesus because all these scriptures point to that moment. Verse 147, I prevented the dawning of the morning, or the way uh, prevented is used there. It's an archaic meaning. We don't use it in modern English anymore. But I anticipated the dawning. I looked for the dawning of the day. Or I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, I hoped in thy word. Mine eyes prevent or anticipate the night watches that I might meditate in thy words. Does that remind you of Gethsemane? Yes. Hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness, O Lord. Quicken me, which means what? Make me alive. Make me alive. Put life into my spirit according to thy judgment. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. They are far from thy law. Do you hear the footsteps of Judas approaching when you read that scripture? And those representatives of the temple, priesthood, and so forth that came to take him, who had delivered Jesus to the Roman authority? They're there. It's written. These things have foundations. They draw nigh. I can hear them coming. But here's the glory. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth, living truth that's ever been. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. And that's what the voice of truth does. It gives us forever foundations. It shows us what would transpire at Gethsemane, contained within what is the greatest, lengthiest psalm of them all, uh, to that, to a time of its composition, the highest point of praise ever achieved on earth in the Old Testament, a symphony of praise so divine that it reaches right into the mission of the chosen one, the Messiah that Jesus was destined to be, and to rival, it rivals the moment when the morning stars sang and the sons of God shouted for joy. The worship service at the dawn of creation from Job chapter 38, verse 7. It's a prayer for deliverance, 
just in, in general terms, that's certainly true. But it's a perfect mirror reflection of Matthew 26 and the gospel story. I cried with a whole heart. It's the taking of the cup of trembling, just as it was at the Last Supper before the resurrection, and just as it was in Gethsemane. As verse 150 there it tells the whole story. It hears the approaching footsteps of one Judas, Judas of the city of Kerioth. Uh, thus he became known as Judas Iscariot, man from Kerioth. And, and those that followed him, Spirit of the Lord heard those footsteps far in advance of their happening. And now we have something that speaks to us. We have something that speaks to us by the blood of Jesus. Let's turn to St. John chapter 18. As the blessed hope we live by is that upon sharing the word of God together. We're going to read one verse here, which is verse 11. St. John 18, as the word is ours. Amen. The word belongs to you. The Bible's not yours just because you purchased it off a shelf. It's yours because it was written for you. It belongs to you spiritually. Amen. It's not of our own making. Our ownership doesn't come by that. But we do come to the kingdom and the place of inheritance by the blood that was shed for us. As Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and, and the word proclaims itself of its own merits, its own truth. Uh, but it does need voices to carry the word of God to others. And by agreement with saints of all ages, I like to look past the corridors of time. I don't like to feel any distance between our brethren of past, present, or future. We're all part of the same story. As we've entered into the labors of those that have come before us, we labor now for the witness of Jesus. We labor to pass on the torch to those who follow us and others who will take up the cross after us, because none of us are complete without the other. And that's a spiritual consideration. Can you feel kinship with somebody who lived at another time, lived across the, on the other side of the world, spoke a different language, different uh, background as to race and all those things? Can you feel companionship? Well, you're sure better if you're part of this gospel. Amen. Amen. You're going to be made alive, amen, by the fact that we love one another, <clears throat> even as God loved us, fulfilling the first and second commandments. As the perfect lamb of sacrifice was given so that we can all sing together. We're there when they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, Old Testament faith, New Testament faith. Those who witness for the word of God and now also have the testimony of Jesus. That puts it all together. Amen. Thank the Lord. Brings us all into a better place. So we hold on to these words, these phrases, these ideas, these eternal truths that are come up to us off the pages of the Bible. Because when all else fails, it'll stand. Everything else you put your hope in will fall. Build a tower, one day it'll fall. Build a nation, one day that nation will fall. Put your trust in the Lord. When, uh, in the words of the fire song, when the world's on fire, don't you want God's bosom to, for, to be your pillow, to be your comfort, to be your stay in that day of great slaughter when the towers fall? You'll be standing on higher ground. So you've got an advocate. You've got someone to speak for you. You've got the speaking blood, the atoning blood of Jesus, amen, to speak for you. He's our great lawyer advocate. Thank the Lord. Who's my lawyer? Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Thank the Lord. Amen. I got the blessings of the, the law firm of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. It's all contained within one person. Amen. One Lord, one faith, one baptism of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. It's all contained within. We've got someone to speak for us by his blood. And here in St. John chapter 18, this after Simon Peter, he drew a sword. He was resorting to violence. That wasn't the way that uh, the word of God would be fulfilled. 
the word of God would be fulfilled, amen, complied with by the sacrifice of Jesus himself. So the second part of the verse is our focus point, but to uh, read the, all of verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. God's kingdom's not of this world. Spoke that in Pilate's Hall, if you recall that. Amen. If my kingdom were of this world, then yeah, my servants would take up the sword and fight. But this is a different kingdom. All right, second part of the verse. And it leads into our subject title, of course, him being willing to take the cup. For it reads, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? This is the way prescribed. This was ordained from the very foundations of the world. He could have chosen otherwise in the sense of ability to do so. Could Jesus have done that? Yes. He could have called 12 legion of angels, destroy the world, and set him free. But he could not turn aside in the manner of holiness to not take the cup, because that's, that's the very reason for which he came. Had to be. To fulfill all righteousness, because God is the standard of holiness. God is our standard. God's our banner, Jehovah Nisi. As the, the standard bearer of holiness, if he disobeyed even one scripture himself, well, then God's not holy. And promises that are made toward an expected end, they have to be kept. So Jesus was led away but not before he took of the cup there at communion, and he would take of the cup of the suffering of the cross willingly, amen. And that signified, amen, that he was willing to endure, willing to endure for you and I. And so he did endure, and now he lives, amen. Let's stand and pray. Brothers and sisters, come forward. We're gonna sing the old rugged cross. It's in the green hymnal, page 228. We're going to stand and pray. And then uh, following prayer, we're going to read a portion of scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But thank the Lord for what he has done, the marvel of it and the story of it. It endures right to this day, being the greatest story ever told, for which we give him praise in the moments of solemnity, in the times to be still and know that he is God, and we give him praise also at the time of the shout of acclamation. We thank the Lord that he is with us now and forever. As we bow our heads in praise, Sister Miriam, Sister Patty, play through the old rugged cross. Father, we thank you for this time of holiness. That not that we have any holiness, but Father, you've brought your holy gospel to us and showed us the way of life. You paid the price, made the sacrifice, paying a debt that you didn't owe because we owed a debt that we could never pay. But you paid it for us, and now we're made free through the blood of Jesus that speaks better things than that of Abel. So let the freedom of the Spirit, the freedom of the Lord dwell within each faithful hearer and doer of your word as we come forth to take of the bread of life and the cup of the shedding of your blood. Father, may these things be made real within each and every soul, all through the name and faith of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Well, bless the Lord. Amen. As we gather on the front benches, we'll receive communion from the yeah. brothers and I will serve it. But from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the 23rd verse, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you to show the Lord's death until he come. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. We show his death within the taking of the cup, his sacrifice made for us, but we also show the quickening power. We also show the life of Jesus within our being when we do so. Amen. Bless the Lord. The old rugged cross.
Yeah. 